morning. Our first stop of the day is going to be at our local John Deere dealership to talk to the planner expert about our vacuum issue on the Exact Emerge corn planter. And I may possibly ask about those rumble strips inside of the meters to see if they need replaced. If you want to be technical, it is my second stop of the day. The first true stop was at my accountant, but I don't want to bore any of you with that kind of nonsense. Mustang, who I believe is the best planner mechanic at this place, works in this corner of the barn. He's the same guy who rebuilt the inside of our S670 combine. I'm gonna run inside and pick his brain a little bit. My dad and I have always been big believers in stopping by and talking to the mechanics personally before you escalate to a service call because it could save you quite a bit more money. Nothing against the mechanics, but we work for much less money per hour than they do. Mike in there gave me some good things to check out. I'm gonna run through all those on that vacuum and if it does not pan out, then we will have to have a service tech come out and look at that planner. The local planner expert in there also said that although those rumble slash vibration strips are far from the most important part of the unit, if they're starting to get worn out, it probably would not hurt to just go ahead and replace them. The parts department had 24 in stock, so I took all 24. If I don't need them, I'll return some of them. Does anyone want to guess how much one of those plastic strips costs? Well, if you guessed darn near $20 per strip, you'd be right. So we've got almost $500 worth of plastic strips here in this box to put on our planner. Hey, I'll be the first one to admit that $500 seems like an awful lot of money for a measly box of parts. Although it does not take very much at John Deere to spend that kind of money on a part. At least we're getting 24. Some parts are $500 and you don't even have a quarter of it bought. Let's get down to the shed, get the doors opened up, and dive into this planter. It's a great thing we're going to be working inside today because it just started sleeting outside. I've got a quick story that adds a little bit of value to this conversation. Last night, after putting all this together, putting the row units and the brushes and everything together on the Exact Emerge planter, I got home, I was thinking about those rumble strips, whether or not we needed to replace them. At some point in the night, I started flipping through TikTok and yes, I know China's using TikTok to steal our information and harvest our dopamine, but that's a story for a different day. I was flipping through TikTok and I saw a gentleman who uploads a lot of videos in relationship to planners. I can't remember his name off the top of my head now. If I remember it when I edit this video, I'll throw it in there. But he was talking about the value of your planter per hour. The guy in this video proceeded to ramble off some calculations about acres per hour and dollars per acre to show what the gross productivity of your planter was in the spring. In the case of this exact emerge planter, if we average 70 acres an hour, which is not really a set number, but probably a good average, with local fall 2023 grain prices at maybe 520 per bushel, expecting a yield easily of 220 bushels per acre, that makes this machine right here capable of putting in a gross value of over $80,000 per hour in corn plants, across our farm. Basically, that puts your $500 replacement parts in perspective as a very small price to pay to have a machine functioning at its full capability. The guy in the video also mentioned that that is your max value. It cannot really go up any more than that, but it can certainly go down. So you want to make sure that you're maximizing productivity and quality on your planter, especially when it comes to corn, which I talked a lot about in the last video. You want to make sure you're doing everything the best you can. That's why we put some of these spiked closing wheels on, and that's why we're just going to go ahead and replace any of those strips that need replaced. Another good way to look at the cost of replacing this isn't necessarily on a dollars per hour basis, but more specifically, on a dollar per acre of usage basis. I'm just gonna speculate, I don't know the actual number. Let's say that since we bought this planter, it's planted 10,000 acres of corn. If those parts lasted that entire time, take $500 divided by 10,000, that's pretty easy math. That is five cents per acre for those wear parts. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that even though you've paid for something, does not mean it's free to run. That's not really that big of a price to pay at five cents per acre of use. One day we will have to do some rebuilding on those delivery brushes. That'll be a whole different beast. We will cross that bridge when it comes. I would agree if you'd say that we probably should have just replaced these before we buttoned everything up. Not really that big of a deal and we're not pressed for time. It is only the beginning of March, not to mention it's sleeting outside. So I don't think we're gonna have to worry about planning today. Pull the plate off and here we have that strip. The planner expert claimed that this strip right here is responsible in corn for keeping the seed tumbling as the plate goes around. 
it's supposed to help with performance somehow and obviously it's been doing something considering how worn it is in this half or even two-thirds of the strip so we're gonna pop these out and replace them we've got our box of replacement strips Chris is gonna go ahead of me and open up all of the units pull the hose off and open the lid that way I can just focus on doing the strip part shouldn't be too difficult to get off A little bit of graphite and seed coat on the outside there. There you have it. That is the old used worn out one and this is the new one. You see the difference. These are just for corn. In soybeans you would take this out and they actually have a smooth strip. Corn and soybeans obviously have different preferences about how they flow through the unit. Most of that has to do with the way the seed is shaped. Soybeans are all round or somewhat round. Corn can have a lot more obtuse angles on it. What we do is pop this into place. Sometimes it can be kind of tricky to get the new ones in. And I do think we have replaced a few of them in the past. There we go. Smooth. Is that all the way in? One looks faulty. I don't know if you guys can see this. The strip on this one is out of the groove. I'll try and put it back in, but if that's not going to work like that, being that it was $20, I'm going to pop that one out and get a good one. Just for another angle there, see it's elevated there. This one's seen all of those acres and there's not a single part of it popping out. Of course, the rest is ground down. But we won't settle for that. This one looks much better. What are the chances that the first one we pull out is faulty? Beautiful. Plate back in, and we're ready to go. Chris and I are gonna go around and do all this, and I'll check back in with you. It's been about 30 minutes. Chris and I have got all but two rows complete. We've got two extras because for some reason on the left side of the planter here, we've already changed two of them probably last year. Maybe they were in terrible shape and we went ahead and did that. It's fortunate that we didn't need all 24 because like I said, we've got the faulty one in here and the extra probably won't keep because this isn't really a part that breaks take it back to the dealership, get a parts refund, and then let them know that this one was bad. I've got those in my truck so I can just run them back to the dealership when I go back into town. It's not exactly a lovely day to be outside with this sleet and cold breeze. I'm glad that we have a roof to work under, especially on the planters. Okay, we did the straightforward and simple job, which was replacing those rumble slash vibration strips. Now we gotta figure out why vacuum one was not wanting to work the other day. The John Deere mechanic gave me a short list of things to look at including that I had my hydraulic lines in the right spot. You check a few values on the screen and a few other odds and ends to make sure it works. Well, the lines are definitely in the right spot because you can see on the fourth slot up on top, we've got a Roman numeral four on that line. And on the bottom, the third slot here, we've got a Roman numeral three. So those are all hooked up right. It probably wouldn't hurt to put a little more hydraulic oil in it it is well within the acceptable range though, so I doubt that that's a deal breaker. Seeing no evident issues on the back, we'll hop in the tractor, fire it up, and see if we can figure anything out on the monitor. Someone asked me on a previous video where we got the aftermarket footrest for these earlier 8R series tractors. These were through the John Deere parts magazine that they put out pretty regularly. I want to say they were two to three hundred dollars, which is a tad bit ridiculous in my opinion. But we've already kind of shared you the story of how expensive John Deere parts are with those strips. It'll be nice for dad. It's cheaper than upgrading to a new 8R like that one that has pre-installed foot pegs. If I recall correctly, they just mount under this mat on the bottom. There's a bunch of bolt holes and stuff. Secure them down and then you can plant or grain cart in comfort. Okay, let's see. Current time incorrect. About that later. Planner auxiliary. Auto. One thing the mechanic did say was to go ahead and fire up the electric power generator. So we're gonna do that. If I can recall that. Nope. Okay, 
I gotta do the generator first. Which is on the PTO. Should be spinning now. Okay. Right, test on the row units. Should be testing everything. We don't have seed in. Hopefully though, it will see that the units are turning. I've kind of jumped to a completely different project here at this point. You can hear all the row units running. You can see that shaft coming off of the main motor spinning the row unit in there. It's doing its test. Obviously this would work much better if we actually had seed in it. It didn't tell me that any of the units were not spinning at all. It can't give me an actual performance evaluation because there was nothing running through the units. Let's fire the vax up because that's what we're here to look at. There's three. It's the one that's been giving us issues. As you see, there's a little bit of dust there. These vacuums know that the planter's not planting, so they're not actually trying to do much, but it is a good sign to see some dust. Let's kick the other vacuum in and see if that creates any problems. Two are running. Looks like we have more dust moving and I've not gotten any errors on the monitor, which is a good sign. Chris is hustling around as if he has any idea how to fix this. Let's throw her in plant mode and see if we can get the fan running and if everything works together, then maybe the problem's resolved itself. Probably wouldn't hurt to give her a few more RPMs. Not seeing any issues. Maybe it was just a day one fluke. <laughs> oh, my poor clean tractors. I'm so sorry. That went from our main issue to a non-event, so let's pull the wheels back up and call it quits on this planter. Generator is off. The only thing I really need to do beyond this point is put seed in the planter and make sure the units are going to run. We're pretty confident in this machine, so we'll probably do that when we get to the field the first day to plant. Is that the wisest thing to do? Probably not, but that's just how we're going to do it. We've had pretty good luck with this Exacto Merch planter, other than a few issues the first year we had it. I know some other people, like Millennial Farmer, also known as Zach Johnson. Some of you may have heard of him or not, I don't know. He's got an Exacto Merch retrofit planter, so he took his old frame, put the Exacto Merge units on it, which is essentially the same thing, just a different route. And he's had a lot of issues since he's done that. Wish him nothing but the best, but don't let that discourage you because these are phenomenal planters. We have not had any major issues with this that I can recall since we got it new and got some of the early kinks worked out. Knock on wood, because I probably just jinxed us. No, those are trash in that I box. Know. Was there anything to report? It looked like both vacuums were running. Yeah, the one thing is you're going to have to re-wax the other tractor. Well, I know, I saw that, but... <laughs> so I, it just, it wasn't for a while, was, it, was that interested in the computer? No, it just fired right up. I don't know, maybe that was a yesterday thing. Yeah, oh, uh, Chris and I are a little concerned on the PTO generator here. It seemed a little loose when it was running. So I don't know if we've got it set in there right or if we need to adjust the mounting. He had a good idea to go look at the ADAR370 because although the other planner is not an exact emerge, with electric units it does have a supplemental power generator. So I'll see how they set it up on that tractor and we'll try to get this to the same spec, assuming they did it right on that one. I'll be honest, at first glance, it really does not look that different. Seems to be sitting at the same angle, maybe a little bit down at the end versus the other one we have a little bit higher. I can adjust that pretty easy. Give it the old shake test. Nope, that one's in there firm, so maybe we do need to adjust that one. I may just defer that one to the boss when he gets back, because he's a little more particular than I am. That and he'll be running that planner, so I'll let him make the final decisions on what he wants to do. We are now going to focus our attention onto this beast. It is a brand new planner, but it lacks a few things that I'd really like it to have. Mainly a backup camera, so I can see behind it. Although I will say that I can see behind this DB60 better than I could see behind our 1770 split row folding planter. Because it had the row units up high, they'd fold the back rows up and it blocked my vision. With this, as long as I can see around these tanks, I can actually have a good idea what's behind me. That's not to say that I'm not going to still install a backup camera because it provides more value than just looking at traffic. It also helps when I'm trying to back up to a ditch or to the seed tender to see if I'm close enough 
to where I want to be. On top of that, I'm going to be stealing a monitor out of the 9620 to put in the 8R370, which I'll explain now. This 9620R four-wheel drive tractor and our 8R370 are very similar in the fact that they both have built-in Gen 4 displays that handle all of the GPS processing along with tractor functions. The one thing that our 8R370 did not come with that this 9620R has is a second extended monitor. An extended monitor like this right here is not a processing unit. It is literally, as the name implies, an extended monitor. It can share functionality and screens with the main system. It does not hold any kind of activations or even really necessity to running the systems we run in this tractors to steer. All of that is on this main monitor and more specifically, I think it's tucked in on the seat here somewhere. So I don't personally think that a tillage operator needs two monitors. Really, as long as their heated seats on and their auto steer lines are straight, they probably don't have anything else to watch. I'm going to pull the second monitor out of the 9620R because, like I said, don't think the drivers need it, and move it over here to the planter tractor because I do think I could greatly benefit from having more screen space to watch the performance of my planter along with the tractor and, of course, keep an eye on my auto steer stuff. For as little as these extended monitors actually do in the tractor, they're fairly expensive. That's why I'm robbing this one as opposed to just buying a new one. gonna take this entire bracket with me because I may need a little bit of flexibility on where I put this. You can tell this was installed from the factory because it had a lock nut on it. I can guarantee you we'd never use a lock nut. Not because it wouldn't be nice, but just because we never really have one on hand. There you have it. John Deere extended display in all of its glory. This is the fun part of the day for me. I've always enjoyed working with all the technology on the farm. My dad, Chris and Jeff, Maybe not so much. You stay there for a little bit while I figure things out. The million dollar question now is, where am I going to put this monitor? I don't really like the idea of it being down there. I feel like that corner's too high. Where I'd like to put it is over in this corner somewhere because I'm actually gonna spend most of my time kind of shifted to the right anyways. If I could have all of my planner readout right up here, it would be so convenient. I'd really love to put it up here with this, but. I feel like I'd be asking a lot out of these mounting brackets. Eh, we'll try it. First thing we gotta do is flip this bracket upside down. Should only be mildly frustrating. If anyone else has ever dealt with this hardware, you'll know how much of a pain in the rear end it is to move these like this. Making quick work out of it. That's scary. That's what I get for saying something. The extended monitor is mounted and pretty darn secure. I'm happy with its location. It looks pretty square. One thing people don't realize is that you gotta watch out for your main monitor because if you put it down here, when you swing, you'll start to hit. Like I'm grabbing this radio cable right there. So something to kind of be cognizant of as you do projects like this. This thing can do quite a bit of damage to things up here and vice versa. Things on the window can do a lot of damage to your screen. That leads us to our next issue, the standard extended monitor cable which is only like a foot long will most certainly not reach from up here down to the post where the only connections are don't worry everyone no need to fret our friends at john deere have a 300 dollar cable to add a couple extra feet you can always count on them when you need something just not going to be cheap other than maybe doing some cable management we're good to go we've got plenty of slack i'm gonna fire this up let it boot up a little bit then we're going to play around with the settings on the screen. Hopefully it turns on. Oh, yep, they're both on. Since I've got both screens hooked up, I'm going to go ahead and fire up the tractor to make sure all the data is coming in from the planner and start doing some organizing on the screens. It is kind of comical. I can flick through these pages like it's nobody's business. My dad and my uncles, on the other hand, I've mentioned that they're not a big fan of all the technology. Then again, they'd also just be completely lost. Now they have strengths that I don't have and weaknesses I also don't have, so I'm sure we balance out somewhere. Anymore, if you're running a newer fleet of equipment, you gotta have at least one person there who knows how all this stuff works. If not, you better have your John Deere Auto Steer Tech on speed dial, because you're gonna be talking to him a lot. So far, I've got two screens set up that I think will work for me. I'm gonna pull them up real quick, and then once they're assigned, 
to the screens, I'll see if maybe I need to add anything else. It's hard to tell because I haven't ran this planner what exactly I'm going to want to see. Okay, so here is what I'm currently planning to work with. I've got my main page here, got my five hydraulic remotes so I can keep an eye on how each one of these is flowing, if I need to turn one on or off, just depending on where I'm at in the planning process. I did add the rear view camera display here, that way I can see what's going on right there. Not that I can't just look out the back window, but you know, maybe if there's a hydraulic oil leak shooting sky high like a geyser that I'm not noticing, I might catch it if I look down here. Got all of our auto steer stuff here on the right side so I can change the farm, move lines, tracks, all that fun stuff. Here is a mapping display. That's so I can see what I've planted, where my lines are. That's very useful as you're trying to start and finish fields to know what exactly has been done. And some miscellaneous stuff, engine power to see how much power we're really working with when we're pulling out through the fields, if we can go a little faster, if we need to go a little slower. PTO speed, which isn't really that important, but I like to have that so I can see if it's actually on. And this PTO remote, that may be a point of contention later on in the season when we're actually planning. If I hit on, which it doesn't like if you hit on if the PTO is not on, that turns on the PTO remote, which allows you to get up out of the seat without the tractor shutting it off. I don't know how this is all gonna work with a PTO on the planner because I probably will be getting out a lot with the PTO on the planner on. So we'll cross that bridge when it comes. Here's what I have in mind for the higher up screen in the corner. This is going to be reading out all of the performance data from the planter. There's a lot of different things you can look at on these screens right here. I'm not really gonna go through them all, but you can get a lot of different charts and keep an eye exactly how your planner's performing. I did put a little map in the corner there because I thought it might be useful to have another small map if I get caught staring at this screen and don't know where I am in the field. And then I'm going to have in this corner, it's not reading right now, some gauge wheel information, which is all part of the hydraulic downforce. It won't load because we're in transport mode still, but once we get unfolded, that'll all boot up and give me some kind of readouts. I did go ahead and add a supplemental third page if I think I need it. It's more of a planner run page. It's got some different stuff. Obviously, I've got another population readout that's customizable to whatever data you actually want to have on there, but you're probably going to watch population mainly. Got a field thing up here so I can see in another location to make sure I'm on the right field. You want to make sure you have that right so all of your data comes out correctly. EPG, which is the generator system, I've got a main switch here for that. Then I have a section control master control. Neat feature here is I can actually play with the sections manually, turn them on and off thought that would be useful if I get in a predicament out in the field, miss a spot, or over plan or under plan. Frame control, that has to do with the markers. Again, like the downforce above, it's not going to load because we're in transport mode. Here's going to be our vacuum readout. We've got three vacuums, so I'll show up here. I don't know how often I will use this page. I thought it would be good to have another page. If not for myself, it would be easy if my dad ever gets in here and runs this because it's not unlikely that he could operate this. And the more pages I have for him to work with should be more of a shortcut than trying to get on the phone with him and say, okay, you need to go to menu and then you need to go to DEA and then you need to go here, here, and there. Well, why don't you just flick to the next page and there's your section control or something like that. Of course, every page here on the bottom main screen is always gonna have this hot bar got a section control master switch there and a few other things so I think we're in good condition to go ahead and plant whenever we decide to go plant it'll probably be another three weeks at least I will probably make some amendments to this as we get going and I see what kind of information I want to have on the screen or if I just think that you know some of these things aren't worth having I know that some of you could probably care less about all that, but it is an important part of modern farming, is mastering the technological side. I had to take a break from all the excitement at the planter to run over to Dad's shed, because we've got some more seed coming in. It's not exactly a huge load of seed by any means, it's actually just one box of corn. However, I've yet to find any seed that just unloads itself, so we gotta be over here to supervise and even do the unloading. I figured it'd be best for everyone involved if I came over here and helped out the process. The seat should be here any minute, so I'm gonna go ahead and fire up the forklift to make sure it starts. It did start for us the other day, so I don't see any reason why it would not start today. Give it a little choke. <laughs> My
might need a little throttle too. I do not believe that this is an OSHA approved forklift seating position. It's where I am though, so we're gonna make do. We still have not gotten much of our seed for this upcoming growing season. All we have in the shed so far are these Don Mario soybeans. Not really concerned, a lot of the seed is at our salesmen's warehouses. They just haven't brought it down. A lot of that has to do with us postponing delivery more so than the salesmen not wanting to drop it off because I think they like to get the seed out of their warehouse as quickly as possible. As is the norm for us, a majority of our soybeans are gonna be Pioneer. Our Pioneer dealer keeps all of those soybeans up at their warehouse in bulk storage bins until we're ready to plant them. When we roll up with the seed tender, they'll go ahead and treat the exact number of units we want with all the products, load it straight into our tenders, then we can just go load the planter. We don't have to waste a bunch of space in our barn. So that does save us a lot of room in here. All of our corn, regardless of brand though, will end up in this shed before we plant it. One of these days, I'd really like to get this blade unhooked from the 7330 and get it moved to a different shed. It's taking up a lot of room along with my mom's boat in the other corner. It would help to have a little bit more leg room to stack seed in here. The only issue with unhooking this is that although it is March and planting season is just around the corner, there's no guarantee that we do not get a big snowstorm, which is why this is hooked up. So we'll probably leave it hooked up for the meantime. Eventually though, we're just gonna have to get it unhooked out of necessity. I'm gonna go ahead and shut this off. The seed guy texted me and told me he's still 25 to 30 minutes away. That's two for two so far this season with not having accurate scheduling. That's probably just as much on me as it is on the delivery drivers, but it's still kind of annoying. I'll run back over to the machine shed and get some more groundwork done for our next project. That would be one major perk of having a new shop is that we could also transfer our seed storage requirements over to that one. So we could have an area that we work out of store seed in as opposed to being so spread out like we are today. Our next project is sitting in this box waiting to be deployed. There shouldn't be any surprises. I've already told you what's in here. Cameras for the new planner. Oh. And now they're on the ground. There's actually two sets of camera systems in here. One of them I'm going to be equipping on the DB60. The other one I have intentions of installing on the 2020 Hagee when it arrives here in the next week or so. So I'm just gonna leave a lot of this stuff in the box. Historically, I've always liked going the extra mile, installing more lights on the planter for better visibility and of course the cool factor. I found that those projects always end up a little bit on the disappointing side. They never pan out as good as you expect them to. So I'm just gonna do the cameras on this. No extra lighting. This does have the premium lighting package Although I do think there's an additional performance lighting package, which is even cooler that you can get installed after market. Something that maybe we'll look at in the future. For now though, we're just gonna be worried about safety and reliability with the cameras. It looks like I may actually have to unfold this slightly to accomplish the wiring part. I'm a big believer in wired cameras over wireless cameras if you can make it happen. Wired cameras have a much higher reliability rating, in my opinion, than wireless. The wireless ones always seem to break or constantly lose connection. So anytime I can use a wired camera, I will. Unlike our two-point planners, this one actually has a little wiring harness bundle and shield running down one of the side draft tubes. That will actually be a very pleasant way to run the cable lines back. It'd be nice to put it on the middle telescoping frame tube except for because it goes in and out, you'd have to have the appropriate amount of slack and the amount that that telescopes would require way more slack than you wanna keep track of on your planner. So I'll probably run one of these cables down here. It looks to me like I am probably gonna be better off unfolding it. Not that it's a necessity, but it may make my life much easier. And to unfold this thing, I probably have to get it out of the barn. Well, actually, I might be able to unfold it a couple of feet before I run into the 9620R here. This is our limiting factor with unfolding. Just putting those wing wheels down would actually gain me a lot of working room under there. Yeah, let's try that so we don't have to get this thing out in the miserable weather today. Okay, let's see if we can recall how to unfold this thing. Cations, DEA, that's not it. That one? No, that's not it. How do I unfold this? Machine settings, seed star? No, that's the same thing. Huh. 
I do know on this top monitor page I have, if I hit tools, I can come up to frame control, which is exactly what I need. So maybe that's just going to be my shortcut to getting here. And I believe we need trans lift first, and then we got to turn it on. That should be on one. Yep. Those wing wheels are now in their lowered position. And we're going to go to draw bar. Turn that on. Draw bar is on the second lever. Wow, I got this down pat, ladies and gentlemen. Look at it go. It's also not the fastest moving cylinder on the planet. Just need to get low enough that that brace in the middle comes loose. Okay, we've cleared that. Now we need to do wing fold. Did you guys go out there and stop me before I hit the 620? That'll do. I am a little concerned with the possibility that my dad may operate this soybean plant or some, just for the simple fact that this whole folding deal is not the most intuitive system in the world. The names aren't all indicative of the fold order. I almost think I need to put together like a little document for them, maybe print off a piece of paper and say, hey, here's what you do first, here's the lever you use, and then go through the steps, and then also do the same in the reverse order so we can actually fold and unfold this thing if he needs to. Because it isn't uncommon for him to run this planter, especially when we get into early summer, if we're doing some replanting. I may be tied up spraying something, you never know. So I'll probably have to do something like that. I would speculate that that would go a long way and be much more enjoyable than a phone call with him trying to walk him through it. It looks like we're gonna have to figure out some additional supports or bungee cords here to keep that off of the frame area. You can get by with having your hoses dragging on the frame. Over time though, that'll catch up to you pretty quickly. You'll start to wear holes into the braiding on the side of your hydraulic lines. One thing leads to another. Next thing you know, you're out there while you're trying to beat a rain and you've got a blown hydraulic line that needs changed. So we'll figure that out before we hit the field. Here's the tube we're gonna run our camera line on to the back of the planter. Everything will snug up nicely under this little ledge, which is really convenient. Run it back to where those hydraulic lines are and then figure out where we wanna mount it. Currently, I'm just thinking about two camera angles that seem valuable to me as an operator. First and foremost, obviously, is the one on the back end, looking behind for traffic, and of course, lining up with seed tenders, as I mentioned earlier. A secondary idea I had was to have a camera that kind of looks at my mainframe tires here. I have a little bit of a concern that they may have issues or could be a point of failure on this machine. And having cameras on that while I'm going down the road and knowing they're all aired up would probably bring me a lot of comfort. And it's so easy to run cameras when you're doing it, it probably wouldn't hurt me much. I can't really think of anywhere else where I would truly benefit from a camera. You can't really put them in the sea tanks because they're just gonna get too dusty to see what's going on. If any of you guys have great ideas on somewhere else to put cameras on this planner, drop me a comment down below. Let me know what you think would be a good idea. The 10 inch display I have in the tractor is capable of running four cameras at once. So if I find something that's worthwhile, I can find a couple more cameras pretty easy. And I'm never too hard to sell on more technology on something. It looks like our one box of seed is coming down the road right now. I'm gonna get the forklift fired up, get my legs stretched out, see if I can unload this without causing a mess. Just unloaded a 50 unit box of Channel Bio 21046 Double Pro Corn, courtesy of Chris Heller. I say courtesy as if we didn't pay for it, 
We paid for it, but he's the one who sold and serviced it to us. This specific hybrid performed really well for us on a farm just southeast of here last season. It was above our weighted farm average of 243. I believe this hybrid made in the mid 250s, maybe low 250s. I don't have the numbers right on top of my head at the moment. It was good corn for us. We also had some 116 day corn on a farm to the southwest about a mile. It made right around 245-ish, which is only barely above our weighted average. However, that farm in particular is more impressive to yield at 245 than some of these other farms are at 255. It's just kind of a relative comparison deal. Not every farm is as good as the neighboring farm. We've had some pretty solid luck with this channel of corn. Chris Heller has been good to work with over the years. He's a young guy like myself, so we like doing business with him. The unfortunate nature of the beast in farming in the seed industry, as I mentioned when we unloaded some of this Burris product, is that if you really want to get the best price from a seed company, you need to be able to offer them a considerable amount of acres. 100 acres of corn's probably not going to get you much negotiating power. They want five to a thousand before they'll even really start to get competitive on pricing. To continue to capture the best prices possible from our main two suppliers, Pioneer and DeKalb, we've had to kind of cut back on some of these smaller orders, which is unfortunate. I wish we had enough acres to be able to give everyone a considerable chunk here and there. We just don't have the ability to do that, and we've kind of gotten squeezed by some of our larger companies wanting more units to retain the same competitive average price. Some of you may understand how that works in the farming industry, and it probably happens in other industries as well. It just stinks because you brush shoulders with a lot of good, genuine people like Chris or like Griffin Green from Burris, and you just wish you could give them more volume than you do. I use the same brand of backup camera on the grain cart and I really like the price point and the quality of everything. So I went ahead and ordered another two sets, like I said, one for the planter and one for the Hege. You can see the brand right here, Fuku, Fuku. I don't know how you say that. It's really nothing too extravagant other than the fact that they are 1080p cameras, meaning that the resolution of the image is higher quality than most of what you're gonna find. They don't sell these cameras individually, unfortunately, so I did buy another set. Really was not that expensive for a camera. You could probably buy five of these sets for what one cab cam system costs. I did that though because I wanted two more cameras. There's our two high definition wide field of view cameras. I had the foresight in the fall when I was wiring up the 8R370 with the grain cart to get a 10 inch display in there and then note that if I get the same brand of cameras, I won't need a second display. I could just unplug the grain cart, the cameras, leave them with the grain cart, get another couple cameras to put with the planter, and I can just keep using the same display. So that's why I got two cameras and I don't need a display. Should be pretty easy to do. I used to spend a fair amount of time concerning about where I mounted the cameras and drilling holes. I've kind of wisened up and I just started buying these ultra strong magnets and then I bolt the camera onto the magnet and then I can move it around anywhere I want. I'm not really caught in one area if I don't like it. I was looking for my washer, I couldn't find it. And he was trying to sneak under on the bottom of this magnet. Almost worked. This nut is closer to an 11 millimeter than a 12, but we'll make do. One camera done. Second one started. All we gotta do now is pick and choose where we're gonna install our cameras. I'm thinking for the one on the back, either somewhere underneath this back step or on this back part of the frame, I might play around with it and see where it wants to stick, which actually is about anywhere because I could literally have it there if I wanted. I'll just show you guys how simple this mounting method is. You pick a spot on the implement that is made of metal which about 90% of everything we have is metal. So yeah, that's a good spot for a camera. Bam. And you gotta pull pretty hard to get that off of there. I didn't particularly like that spot though. I found a little metal piece up here that'll give me a little bit better perspective. So we're gonna put our camera up here. One advantage of having it up here is I can also see the back of my row units. That'll give me kind of a better idea of where I'm at in the field relative to let's say a ditch or an end row if I'm backing up to it. And then hopefully I can also see traffic behind me. 
Took me about 10 minutes just to get my wire strung out under the tanks with all the other wires to get it in a spot where it's not gonna be pinched. This probably would have been a much easier project if the planter was unfolded. I've got the first camera wire ran all the way up to about the lift cylinder where I ran out of cable. Fortunately, I do have more spools of this cable wire, so that's not a big deal. Before I make the jump into the cab, I'm gonna go ahead and place my second camera, route it through the same area, and then we'll be good to hook them up. Like I previously mentioned, I wanna use my second camera to keep an eye on these main running tires. I'm thinking that somewhere in this neighborhood would probably be an ideal location for a camera that'll be able to see all four tires. To be honest, I'd really like to put it on the main frame, but wiring the camera to the front is a little more complicated. So I'm gonna have to find a way to make it work right in this area so I can just jump on with the other camera line. I found a pretty solid hunk of metal right here, and I think this will work. This is the only thing where it'd be nice to have it folded up so I know if the row units were gonna be obstructing my view of the rear tires. Doesn't look like it'll block them much, maybe a little bit of the outsides. As long as I can see the bottom of the tire though, I'll know whether or not it has air in it. We got plenty of cable on this one. We're not gonna have any problems reaching the cab. It'd be nice if I could cut an extra 10 foot off the end and use that to get the other one to the cab. If only we could be so lucky. I don't know why I got zip ties made for a horse. That's what we're working with though. Seems a little overkill for camera wire. We're hopping a ride on the 710. I'm just going to go ahead and twist all these together. This will get us pretty close to the cab by having it ran up with the 7 pin connector because that gets fairly high up on the back of the tractor. Time for the final mile of this delivery. Reach down. Oh, of course I dropped it. Darn it. Chris helped me out and grabbed the one I dropped. So we're pretty much done with moving wires around, other than snipping off some zip ties, but that's nitpicky work. Do you think we have plenty of camera line slack? I'd say so. I got my two camera leads plugged in and then I zip tied all the slack together in the back here. I can organize that part later. We do have life though on the cameras. The screen is set up on quad view because I run four on the grain cart. So I'm gonna flip through the settings really quick and get it to two screens only. Wow, the cameras watching the wheels turned out much better than I thought it would. The back one probably could use some adjusting downward so I can see the road units. It's still gonna do a tremendous job there though. I think we can be satisfied with this install. Hmm, I'm still not seeing much of the rows. Maybe that's just not possible at that angle. If I move it downward anymore, I'm not even gonna be able to see what's behind me. So may have to make a sacrifice there or reroute that camera. That's all right. I'm satisfied with where we're at right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and fold this back up if I can remember how. Bring those wings back in. Then you pick up the draw bar. Yeah, it doesn't really appear like folding up has obstructed my view much of these main tires, so I think we're good to go. Alrighty folks, that's gonna be it for this video. Not really a bad day's work. Hopefully sometime on the horizon our sprayer shows up and they get our tanker done, which we'll go check on the tanker in another video. I'm sure they've made some pretty good progress on it because we have had a few nice days since the last time I checked on it. Anyways, that's going to be it for me. I greatly appreciate every single one of you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more. And comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace!